So I'm going to talk about dance as a multimodal uh, practice. And I need to use this because it's not my mother tongue, so I need to read a little bit. I hope you excuse me for that, but I need to. Anyway, my interest in what goes on in a dance class is based on my experiences as a former dancer and now a senior lecturer, or what you said, associate professor, in modern dance. I've been teaching dance for about 25 years, and I just became, or I have become, more and more curious about what goes on in the interaction in a dance class. So I started out my research wanting to know more uh, about what I call the space in between, this space, uh, where a message is expressed by someone and received and interpreted by another. I wanted to expand my knowledge about how dance was communicated, going beyond the seemingly simple act of students mimicking a teacher's movement material. So when I read about a social semiotic, this is a long word, a social semiotic multimodal theory of communication and design theory in relation to learning, I found the theoretical tools I needed to be able to frame and address interaction and learning in a dance class or in dance classes. In social semiotics, the interest lies in how we make meaning and claims that this is happening in a social con context and through social interactions. As social beings, we communicate by making signs in different modes, and that is like sign systems. So we speak, we move, we, we, we paint, we write, we do all different things. Uh, and the written and spoken language is one of many possible. We communicate multimodally. I think that's the pronunciation. And from this perspective, dance can be seen as a performed, embodied, multimodal practice of meaning making. Dance learning is an activity that engages body and mind simultaneously, though I hesitate to make the distinction. I think we're all one. But that's a long philosophical discussion, I won't go into that. So dance learning is an, uh, uh, so the teaching and learning situation can be, can be described as a complex multimodal configuration of signs in different time and space based modes. I think I should change this. Uh, in a dance class, teachers and students engage in the dance practice by using different semiotic modes of communication. Semiosis is the, the, the uh, about sign making. Yeah. So we use the body, we use touch, we use speech, we use gauge, gaze, not gauge, music, and snapping our fingers, other things. And the object of this presentation today is to analyze and discuss a short video documented sequence of a learning situation from a multimodal social semiotic design perspective with a particular focus on how the patterns of interaction falls out and how participants transform the messages in different modes. So from a, a verbal instruction, how do students transform that to a physical expression? And my analytical tools derive from the works by Sigrid Norris. So learning and dance is often, not always, but it's often based on an activity where students repeat movement material demonstrated by the teachers. And yet, through this mimicking act, students transform the movement material into new representations in the meaning-making process. From a design perspective, according to Stefan Selandre and Günther Kress, learning can be described as a mutual process of design. In this design, questions on how participants position themselves, what actions are taken and what resources are offered and used can be put forward. Uh, by using a multimodal uh, interaction analysis, different modes of communication and their interplay are being brought into focus. I have analyzed a short sequence from a videotape dance class. It's a jazz class here at DOC, and the level is advanced. And I have used Sigrid Norris' methodological framework as described in her book, Analyzing Multimodal Interaction, 
Welcome. I will start by just showing you the short clip. So it's from here. Uh, the students are in their third year, and now I keep my fingers crossed that the film is running. This is always me. <laughs> As you can see, lots of things are going on during this short sequence. However, it would be impossible for me to touch on everything. So I will focus on what I find important in relation to my research interest. The focus of my research is to investigate learning and meaning making in dance, focusing on how the learning situation is designed and what semiotic resources are being utilized. So, dance is certainly a practice that it is multimodal as all interaction, it's not only dance. And since the body is the object of and for learning, one of my explorative purposes is to look at how the different modes are being utilized in a dance class. These modes are part of the design of the learning situation as they are the resources that shape the conditions for learning. When I started to analyze this clip, I started to look at the bodies in space, on movements, gestures, gaze, and the last thing I did was listening to the speech, the talk of the, from the teacher mostly. So, and I'm going to, to haunt you a little bit with this clip. I'm going to show it again and again and focus on different things. And if you get fed up, please tell me, so then we won't, I, I will just push it away. So this time we can just look at what kind of modes that are being utilized, that are being used. Um, and with no sound, Peo, so I can sort of say some things in between. Um, so we can see, if we talk about proximity, we can see that proximity is about what Nini so beautifully uh, really expressed. She was moving back and forth, creating different kinds of distances to you as an audience. So proximity is about how, how, what kind of distance we take in relation to each other. So we can see that the teacher clearly has a lot of space. There's a big distance. We can see, and that's a, a mode being utilized. That's a way of communicating. We can also look at the postures of the students uh, and the teacher, of course, how they are facing. Wh where are they looking? Where are they f their feet pointed? Usually, where are feet, uh, feet, feet are pointed is the direction of our, uh, of our attention. Um, and we can see the gaze where students are looking. We can see that a lot of different modes of communication are in interplay here. Uh, do you agree with me? Yes. <laughs> um, so, we can see that the teacher especially is using, using a huge repertoire modes to communicate to the students. And she often does that simultaneously. She speaks. She moves, she makes gestures, she claps, she snaps her fingers, moves in space, touches herself to make a point, pushing her hands on her hips at one point. Uh, and the students seem more passive, but is that the case, I wonder. In the beginning of this clip, they are all engaging in what happens by the use of gaze. They're all looking at the teacher. And I assume that they are listening, so I say hearing. I really don't know that, but I think so. Posture, they're all place, pl uh, facing the, the situation that's happening. And proximity, in a way, they're getting a little bit closer. And then they start engaging by using movements, gestures, sometimes on their own. You can see this guy in red, he starts to practice movements. And sometimes together, as the teacher prompts them to do so. 
So trying to understand how these different modes interplay and how the design of the co communication creates the actions folding out and how this affects the possibilities for learning is of interest here. So from a design perspective, the modes utilized shapes the way the learning is designed. So what is allowed to be used shapes the way. We can look at power stru structures as we look at who and by whom these modes are being utilized. And as I said, maybe we can see what, what modes are allowed to be utilized. Uh, in mul multimodal, this is also hard for Nini, multimodal interaction analysis, the mediated action is the unit of analysis. According to Norris, these actions are of two kinds, uh, lower level actions and higher level actions, not, not in a, a grading of value. Uh, a higher level action is described by Norris as being bracketed by an opening closing and made up of a m multiplicity of chained lower level actions. And several higher level actions can be embedded in one another. So for instance, a lower level action uh, cr that created the situation for me here is somebody put this, uh, whatever it's called here, the computer is here. All these lower level actions make it possible for me to act out on this higher level action of trying to make this presentation for you. Um, so looking at this clip, we can see that this is a section of the class where the teacher is giving feedback on a movement oops, sequence that has just been performed. One higher level action that uh, creates the presumption for this event is the dance class itself. It has a beginning and an end, and without that, the interactions could not take place. Embedded in this are several other higher level actions. The teacher giving feedback to the whole group, that's the situation. Then she, in this situation, also engages herself in giving feedback to, 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 to uh, three students, A, B, and C, I've called them. And in between, she goes back to the higher level action of giving feedback to the group. Uh, and she ha also has a musician, you don't really s see him, I think, at any point. Uh, and that's also a high level action of communicating with him. So if we take the perspective of the teacher, she's engaging in at least five higher level actions during this short time. This is a, hardly one minute. And some of them simultaneously. The students are also engaging in, in several higher level actions. Being in the class, listening to and looking at the teacher giving feedback to A, B, and C, practicing the instructions given by the teacher, engaging in their own practice, and so on. Also some of these simultaneously. I don't think we have to look at this. So how, how is that possible? How can we engage in this sort of multitasking, we can call it? Uh, when we engage in several higher level actions, we do it on different levels of attention awareness. <coughs> Norris talks about three levels of attention awareness, foreground, midground, and background. These three levels are simultaneous when we engage in interaction. And the level of attention depends on the modal density uh, employed, which is achieved by modal intensity, and or complexity. Intensity meaning the importance or the weight of a specific mode. Like uh, now I'm speaking, this has, I hope, <laughs> modal density. That's the only mode in a way that I'm using. If I would stop speaking, this high level action of presentation would go away. It can also be created through, through uh, complexity. Looking at these higher level actions, we can see that the attention and awareness of them are changing during this sequence. We can assume that the higher level action of being in the class falls into the background as soon as the activity starts. The higher level action of the teacher giving feedback is in the foreground for the whole group in the beginning of the clip. Then it sort of fades into the midground as she continues to direct herself directly to student A. In that moment, the teacher and student A are 
their, their interaction is in the foreground for both of them. And the teachers giving feedback to the whole group sort of fades back a little bit into the midground. So if you pay attention to the teacher again, she engages herself in high-level actions that shift between specific individuals to the whole group. And it also seems clear that in this sequence, it is the teacher that employs more power than the students. We can see it by the fact that she is designing uh, the situation. And she is also using, she's also engaged in a high modal density. So that, that brings the attention. Was that clear? Yeah? Okay, so, so this thing, yes, I can move. I thought I was stuck to the computer. This, this thing, <laughs> I felt very restricted. Uh, this thing, I think Lena Hamigren pointed out that we, we could like more see these foreground, midground actions as, as being three-dimensional, which is hard on the flat screen, because it's, they move like this, in a sense. So it's, it's like a circular or like a moving back and forth, which enables us to engage in several higher level actions at the same time. If you, if you think about driving a car, yeah, the, 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 the overarching higher level action is driving the car. I hope that has the, the highest modal density, but we can also interact in talking to somebody that's sitting next to us, which also has a beginning and an end and would be a higher level action. Um, I think we can, we can just look very shortly at, at the clip. And you can have, we can have some sound. Just looking at all the, all the complexity of modes that, that the teacher is using to get this modal density, to get the attention. So she's speaking, she's moving, she's breathing to give an accent to, to what's happening, she's snapping her fingers, touching herself, so she, she's using a complex configuration of signs to speak this language. Now it's five minutes left. So it's a constant, sh it's a constant shift in which high-level actions are in the foreground, mid-ground or background, depending on the modal density of the utilized mode. So in this clip, we can see that the modal density is, is mainly achieved by complexity, as I said. The, students, the teacher and the students engage themselves in this learning situation in a mutual process of design, although the teacher's action shows that she has more power in this situation because she's designing the whole sequence, as I said and by using all these multimodal modes to represent her messages. But the students do execute power also by choosing how to interact. However, they keep within the design of the situation. Nobody's leaving the room. Nobody's actually stopping to, to have attention to this situation. So interpreting the actions analyzed, it becomes clear that students and teachers are involved in a mutual process of design and meaning making. Even though, as I said, the teacher seems to be the most active, we can see that the students design their own path of learning, shifting their attention between different higher level actions, utilizing different modes to interact in the situation. The layout as a mode, and that is sort of the space and how that is furnished or set up, designed, shapes the possibilities both for the students and the teachers to be able to perform the dance class. The space is important. Selandra and Kress speak about uh, the room, the spaces for learning in their book Design for Lärande, et multimodalt perspective. A room is a social space where people take positions and take on roles. We can, by using a multimodal perspective, see how students and teachers use different modes to position themselves in this case, the placement of the bodies in space, the proximity and posture they utilize tell us something about their different roles. The way the teacher intervenes gives us an idea about the engagement and also gives us an idea of what prompts the students to interact. I think it's clear that dance is a performed, embodied, multimodal practice. In this clip, we can see that the modal density 
is created through complexity by using several intertwined modal modes where speech is not the most prominent. So what can be learned? Oh, I forgot that. Oh, no, okay, doesn't matter. Oh, sorry, going back. Uh, dance learning can be seen as a historically shaped social practice with particular norms and power relations which confine the patterns of interaction and affect the student's agency within it. Today, little is known about the semiotic design of dance learning settings and how students transform the displayed actions of the teacher into new representations. A social semiotic multimodal theory of communication and the design theory perspective give me the overall theoretical framing for the situation and the historical practice I am analyzing. It also offers me a way to interpret the situation and by using Norris framework, I can in detail analyze the interaction in dance learning situations. Through this, I hope to expand our knowledge about teaching and learning in dance. Yes. So I put you that you want to see the, you want to see what they practiced. Give us some sound. And that was a nice bow from them, I think. <laughs> Thank you very much, Annika. Thank you, Elizabeth, <laughs> and all of you for coming. Yes, yes of course, Cecilia. Thank you so much, Annika. It was very interesting. I'm also always curious about how, because you, you're doing observations also from the inside since you're teaching yes. also, and you're doing observations from the outside, and how these different perspectives correspond for you in your research. Uh, it's a very important and interesting question, it, and it also relates to ethics, what Nini also was talking about, because doing research, I cannot, I have to really step back and, and not be the dance teacher in a sense. I cannot, I have to try to not use the knowledge I have from talking to colleagues at the coffee table or, you know, in these kind of, of, of settings, because that's not where I'm doing the research. So I have to be very particular with just saying something, however little, about just what I'm looking at. And this is really hard. Uh, but at the same time, the, the knowledge I carry also, uh, I hope, makes it easier for me to interpret what I see. But it's a very fine balance. Has it, has it developed your teaching, do you feel? Of course it has, but in, in a specific way, or? I think, and this is what I hope, because I, I I'm, when I'm speaking about this, I can think that you're all sitting and thinking, well, we know this already, that we do this. But, but looking, out our, looking at our practice is the first thing to change it, I think. We have to really see what we are doing in order to be able to change it. And, and what I find that I see, have seen, I'm just a beginner in this yet, so... But what I see a little bit is that I see a lot of silence, and I'm thinking of why the mode of speech is not more utilized from the students in a dance class, why the interaction might not, and I'm not saying that speech is an, uh, in hier hierarchy more important, and maybe it's not the speech, but it's something about uh, creating more of, a, uh, more of an interactive communication that I have started to think about how to find ways of doing without changing too much. But I think this is the, the most important thing that I've started to think about. So how does this travel? Uh, thank you. I, um, I don't know Norris, but I'm just wondering how you came up with what I think, if I understood, these modes as being, you mentioned motion, gesture, you talked about snapping mm -hmm, and putting mm -hmm. your hand. I think of modes as speaking, drawing, mm -hmm. writing, um, different 
hmm? symbol systems or different yep. modes of communication yep. as opposed to I don't know that I necessarily would understand that this is different than this is different than this is different from walking over to somebody and putting their hands on their back. It's all motion and physical. I'm just wondering how you came to use those uh, definitions, I guess, as modes of communication. Well, as uh, according to Norris and, and other people within this sort of uh, thinking, that a mode is not something we can say that these are the modes we have to sort of decide what we think is the mode of communication in different uh, circumstances. So, it's, it, of course, you're right that it, it's speaking, it's drawing, it's painting, it's all these things. But bodily movement are different. There are gestures. Then there are instructive movements. That is that a gesture, or and is this a sound or a movement? It's both. So, you know. But I understand the question, I, and I would probably have to clarify that much more. So thank you for the question. Thank you. Yeah. We have one more question from Beata, Ardi, and from Lena. Uh, Annika? Hey, <coughs> Beata. You said um, that uh, in order to change our practice, we need to look at our practice. What is your aim with the research you're doing, or what, it, what is it that you uh, hope for in the future as it's an important um, field that you're researching mm -hmm. into? A better life. <laughs> 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 no, I'm sorry. No, but uh, no, <laughs> sorry, that, I didn't mean to. Uh, but uh, I, think, I think what I'm aiming for is something that I be become more and more interested uh, around questions about communication and interaction. Uh, and I've been thinking more and more about how, how to develop that even within a setting, a class setting that still works with what Yanni was talking about, this, this, this way of uh, teaching dance through giving material and all these things. But does it have to be so silent? How can we communicate differently? And how can we engage the students in, um, let, let me say like this, the student's agency is, is what interests me, to take agency over your own learning, even in that situation, and being aware of that. And how can I do that? And, and maybe just because I'm thinking about, uh, if I repeat a movement that somebody shows me, if, if, I, if I do this movement, Maybe Elizabeth just showed it to me, but when I do it right now, it's new, it's completely new. It's been never done. So it's, it's something that I would like to alert the students about the agency of, of this new representation being their own and understanding how, how, it's, how that can happen. And we have to do that, I think, through communication. And then we have to look at how we communicate. Is that an answer? Yes. yes? So a better life. <laughs> Selena? I know it's early in your, uh, in your work, but I'm wondering, given all these different modes, uh, you know, and I agree that you need to categorize them or, or, or yeah. be explicit, but do you already now have an idea of the way in which you would systematize a framework for presenting all these differences that is happening? Are you thinking of talking about this as, a, as several case studies, or are you trying to sort of organize a system of these are the modes used in dance class like this and this, in this genre, or do you have an, yeah, any yeah, idea I, of the yeah, outcome yeah. in that sense? Well, I'm, I, I also, I'm also interested in uh, what I wrote in the abstract, actually, as thought styles uh, deriving from Fleck, Ludwig Fleck, and his ideas about thought collective and thought styles, that we, we, we talk differently uh, in different sort of communities, and dance would be one community, and a dance genre would be another. I don't see you because you haven't... Uh, but you're there, <laughs> yeah? Uh, so different traditions might carry, might carry different uh, ways of communicating and utilizing modes in a dance class. Uh, however, finding this social semiotics, I, I don't think I need Fleck. I can see, I can try to look at that anyway, because I think that also would be beneficial for us as teachers to discuss 
or maybe it's the same, I don't know that yet. But to see, to, to sort of make some kind of comparison, is that an answer? Okay. Is there any more questions? We have, we have a short one here. Uh, thank you very much. I'm also very interested in creating um, articulate practitioners, and unfortunately it, wasn't, it didn't have time for me to get to that in my workshop yesterday. But um, something that I've instituted, um, um, first, first of all, I want to say that to, to, to create a, um, a, a f the feedback, you know, the, that um, to create a, a kind of a context for student, for student speech in the classroom has to be carefully con cultivated. You have, to be, you have to make a lot of time for it. And that means sometimes that there are, there are aspects of the movement or of the, of the perceived process that, that don't run at the same clip. On the other hand, I think that it's, it's um, very, very worthwhile. And I, do, and, I, and I think it makes a better life. Um, a couple of years ago, when I had my first examination of the material, it, uh, I was told that in the 75 years history of, that, of, the, of the School of Dance, they'd never had um, an examination where students responded were meant to respond to questions mm -hmm, about mm -hmm. why are you doing that, mm -hmm. um, uh, what, um, you know, what is the purpose of that exercise, and also how do you feel? And then ultimately being asked at the end of the examination, which I'd ask the examiners to ask, what, um, it, it, has this substance have you changed anything about what you're doing? And this was wonderful for my own reflective practice to get back this information, but also for the students to be able to articulate in a different way their command of the material. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. I agree that how important it is. Yeah, it's important. And I, and I mean, the students do that in, in other sort of... I'm looking specifically at the dance class. And, and it's still a bit conventional, I think. And uh, I don't know if it's so much I'm asking for or hoping for. But it's something with this flow that I'm looking at. But I shouldn't jump ahead at results. Yeah, this is, was a mistake now. Because I don't know. Okay, so, thank you very much, Annika. Thank you, Elizabeth. <laughs>